My name is Daniel Sword and I have the great pleasure to sit here with Hanna Tönnesen, professor both here in Lund and in Copenhagen. And you're working with alcohol and before that you were a surgeon. That's right. But once a surgeon, always a surgeon. Yeah, and once working with alcohol and lifestyle, always working with alcohol and lifestyle. You have, you have a vast world to, to change. Uh, I'm not quite, quite sure I'm the one to change it, but I'm the one to participate in the development of good evidence yeah. for why we should change uh, the world for the patients. Make it a better world. And you can combine these two elements, surgeon and alcohol and smoking and all the different things that affect you afterwards once you had a surgery yeah to to regain health faster and, and become stronger without any elements that weaken you that's right actually um it's not only afterwards it affects you it actually affects you every day but only to a minor degree so when you undergo surgery you really need to draw on all the extra capacity that you have in your body and you don't have that capacity if you have an unhealthy uh, lifestyle. Mm. Have you ever undergone surgery? Oh yeah, yeah, without problems. Without problems. <laughs> You're on the, right, on the right path. And you had an early dream of becoming a surgeon. That's you right. Had a North Star. Yeah, that's right. I wanted to become a surgeon when I was just a little girl. Mm. Um, and I'm very proud that I managed to do it. Mm. Uh, at that time, there were not many uh, women surgeons. Women become surgeon, uh, but now it's very ordinary and it's very good that we have uh, everybody who wants to become a surgeon can be it. At least in the Scandinavian countries. And what's your advice for turning a dream into reality? Oh, it's very much about. Uh, hard work and then follow your dream um, mm. it's if you know what you want to do it's not that uh, difficult to do it yeah but it's a long way to become a doctor you have to start up early because you have good have to get good grades in school so it's yeah but if you, if you know from the almost before you start school if you know that this is what is needed then it's like running a hundred meter um, championship or something like that you know the the velocity that you need to run in order to get the record i'm not i'm not running for any records but i'm i'm running for for mm -hmm. to to do uh, to make conditions better for our patients to make sure that we do not add unnecessary complications to their to their illness. Becoming a patient from being like a person and then become a patient is a huge step in a person's life. Even though you might only be a patient for some days or some weeks or some mm. months, then it's really a change in life. Mm. And uh, it's so important that, and you become very vulnerable um, because you need to have all this extra capacity. You put capacity. your life in the hands of the surgeons. Oh, yeah, and the anesthesiologists yeah. and the nurses and all the good persons working together it's to like make this possible. It's like a formalette race team. Yeah. You all go in there and you do it under pressure and, and they create something beautiful in the end, hopefully. That's the picture you often have in your head and that's what uh, keeps you going. Um, and now I'm not doing surgery anymore. Mm. You find a lot of things early in life. You, you found you're uh, meant to be husband. You were only... 15 years 15. old. Yeah. He was much older. He was 18. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you become the mother of three. And, and uh, now one of them is a doctor. Yeah. And one is a uh, nano Physi physician yeah physics and computer science is the third one yeah so they all got these highly educated good degrees uh, how do you pass that on that that search for knowledge and passion for for science 
I think that one of my children, one of our children said, I don't remember when it was, but once when he gave a speech in some special occasion uh, where we were celebrating something, I don't remember it as I said, and he said when he was a child he was often standing outside uh, the, if you're playing football you're doing it in a, a green area and he felt that when he was a child he stood outside he could scream in and I could answer him when it comes to this specific area of work and now when he became a nanophysics um, then uh, and he also have a, is a biophysics then he had learned a lot more about the human beings and nature and illness, etc. So it was much easier to be part of the play mm. instead of standing outside. Mm. And uh, it's it's very good to have your children um, growing up, still being children, but you have some kind of partnerships or some. Uh, uh, you have a special area where you can discuss special things. Mm. It doesn't matter which kind of education you have, as long as you want to uh, to discuss, as long as you're part of this very interesting uh, discussions and development of ideas and the, the creative part, I think that is what is, has been passed on. So it should be like a Woody Allen movie. <laughs> <laughs> on Manhattan. <laughs> uh, and now you're a grandmother. That's right. So the generations will continue. Yeah, and we have the most wonderful grandchildren. Like we kept the best children to ourselves, we have also kept the best grandchildren. Yeah, amazing. And becoming a surgeon is a, it's a very special field. You don't just you know describe some drugs or, or, or uh, you go into the wild, you go into action. You went into the line of fire. Yeah. Tell us about a day as surgeon. Um, when you're a young surgeon, you're just learning and learning and learning a lot. You have to improve every day, and that's funny. I know it's not funny for the patient to be ill, but it's really a great job to be able to take away some of the problems. When I was a child, I expected that if you do surgery, then the patient is... Uh, healthy afterwards, there would be no problems, etc. But then, when I become a surgeon, and very early in in my medical uh, uh, study period at the medical school, I learned that surgeons also develop complications, which is not good, but that's sometimes the case, and we have to reduce that. Um, but being a surgeon means that you. In the best case, it means that you talk with your patient on forehand and hopefully also with the relatives. You you discuss the after you have identified and diagnosed the illness, uh, then you discuss the possibilities for treatment. Surgery could be one of them, there could be other treatments. Then you include if surgery could be a, a relevant treatment for that patient then you include the anesthesiologist you have the nurses around you and then you discuss together with the patient very openly what are the benefits of surgery and other treatments and what are the the like payment of doing surgery in this case and then you decide if you should offer surgery to this patient and then the patient decide to say yes or no it's the patient's decision in the end but it has to be balanced. And that is where smoking and alcohol, risky drinking, overweight, malnutrition, physical inactivity has become have become some of the very important risk factors for a good surgical outcome. And you have to include those in this uh, balance in the decision making. Because your research right now is, is uh, you find really exciting results that if you smoke or if you drink too much, um, if you don't exercise and all these, you know, the, the, the regular things, then it affect surgery a lot and recovery rate. Absolutely. 
And it's so important that the patient and the relatives are become aware of this knowledge. So, I mean, it's easy for a surgeon to say, you should quit smoking before surgery. It's difficult for the patient to do it. So you should not only offer, inform about the smoking, and you have the duty to do it as a surgeon. It's your responsibility to do it. Um, and then you also should offer some kind of intervention program that could improve it. That's also your duty. And then the hard job is for the patient to quit smoking. But if you are aware of the motivation that undergoing surgery will be easier, you will reduce the complications, then it's, it's really when we ask the patients, we have done studies and, and ask the patients, which is really important, and they have told us that it made so much sense for them to be offered, and all of them would like to be offered smoking cessation intervention program, alcohol cessation intervention program, etc. So when they are aware that there's a problem, then they would also like to get the, uh, not only the information, but also the programs. And it's, it's the big programs that work, it's the big interventions, because there are small interventions and big. But your research shows that... It's, on, it's only the big interventions that research. It's the intensive intervention. That means four meetings of at least half an hour uh, and, and preferable weekly meeting, something like that, supported by a pharmaceutical uh, support whenever possible. That is what works. And the good thing is that when it comes to surgery, those programs do not only work on short term that's the amazing part. You can improve the outcome within four weeks by just adding those programs. But the good thing is that on longer term, uh, you also got a, f a great effect on your health and mm. of your prognosis on the diseases of your recovery, all things like it's that. It's a big percentage that continue to be non-smokers and, and non-drinkers afterwards. Exactly, exactly. It's the same... It's the same level as when you um, uh, when you do it without undergoing surgery. When you give this uh, intensive programs, mm. and today they are recommended, for instance, in uh, in the uh, the English, the <laughs> the British, sorry, not only in England but all over, uh, mm. in their national guidelines that. Intensive smoking cessation programs should be offered to, amongst others, also surgical patients. And these programs cost around a thousand euro, but the extra costs when you're a smoker and undergoing, undergoing surgery is, is about... It's much bigger. It, of course, it depends on which kind of surgery you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But if you take, for instance, surgery of an ankle fracture, uh, where surgery is needed, then the average cost in Denmark is about 5,000 per patient in average. That's for all patients in Denmark, in average. If you are, if you drink too much, you have a risky intake of alcohol, then the cost will be above 15,000, three times as much, 15,000 euros per patient. Mm. I'm not saying that we can reduce it to 5,000 if the patient quits smoking after, uh, in the perioperative period, but at least we can reduce it, and you have 10,000 uh, euros per patient to, uh, to support a mm. quit drinking program. So it's really, it's a huge amount of money. It's, but that's not the important part. The important part mm. is that it's so awful for the patient to develop all these unnecessary complications. But all the people that are smoking probably already knows that is a high risk of early death, and there's you know risk of lung cancer and etc. 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 So they already know this. Why should they be be be, be more interested in, in quitting when they're undergoing surgery than just in in general in life? Because the effect is just around the corner. We're talking about four weeks. If you are uh, quit smoking four to eight weeks before surgery then you will have the complication rate. So it's really around the corner. Usually when you talk about reduced cardiac 
uh, illness or lung cancer, things like that. It's over a long time, and that's important too, mm. absolutely. But getting the benefit right here, right now, and the... And quick the, benefits. It's exactly. almost like a cigarette. <laughs> exactly. You get quick, ben very quick benefits. And then um, uh, the uh, alternative not to quit smoking, you get an awful lot of problems mm. very quickly. And, you, and, and the regular benefits uh, of being a non-smoker and a non-heavy drinker is that you get this effect, the rush of the alcohol or, or, or the rush of one cigarette. But you said that rush disappears. Yeah, very often you're... when you're not a smoker and, and you don't drink have a high intake of alcohol, don't drink risky, then you have an idea on how it is to be a smoker or a, or a heavy drinker or something like that. But when it comes to reality, in the beginning when you're smoking, you might get some euphorism like when you're drinking, but very soon uh, then you get only the problems by drinking and by uh, problems by smoking means that you smoke to reduce the withdrawal symptoms. Mm. You're not smoking to get an effect. You're smoking. The effect you get is you feel, oh, now I'm relaxed. But what you really relax from are the, the withdrawal symptoms. Mm. It's so, really amazing because yeah. you don't relax really when you get a cigarette. You actually get... Uh, if you are usually a non-smoker and you get nicotine, it's like um, uh, what is it called like. Uh, um, you try to reduce the, the abstinence. No, that's when you are a smoker. But yeah. you, if you, in the early phase, then it's like when you take e epo or epo. Yeah, amphetamine yeah, for, or something like blood. that. It's to increase the yeah. uh, the energy, etc. High altitude training. Exactly. Things and, like that. And but the, that disappeared. And can you replace these bad habits with good habits? <laughs> I try to train every morning. And when, when I don't, I feel a little bit irritated and, and not so calm. And It's like a morning cigarette. And, and it, this is my habit now. It's absolutely a better habit than the cigarette. Yeah. No doubt about that. And again, it is important not to become addicted to... Uh, to, uh, for instance, uh, exercising, unless you are going to be uh, some uh, athlete, athletic uh, champion for the Olympic Games or something I like that. I think that's the, too late for me <laughs> anyway. But, but, but it's very good to exercise, but again, don't overdo it because it's not healthy to do it, overdo it. But it's healthy to do, for instance, like four hours or eight hours per week or something like that. But... 20 hours per week or 30 hours per week really draw on your mm. on your no ultra marathon it only yeah. <laughs> weakens <laughs> the body in the end yeah exactly and so how how, how should you live to become a, a world class surgeon i mean you have to have energy you have to go in there at night uh what i don't think you really in, i mean you have to take care of yourself and your family but I don't think that you can, you can change that much. It's more like there are some demands to be a surgeon. You have to have night shifts very until you get rather old, and you have to be able to like this way be wake up in the night if you have to do something, etc. And and it seems to me that some persons uh, can do it or can learn it, and some can never learn it. And they should never be surgeons, or maybe only in daytime. Um, so when you when you go in in there into the, then you are completely awake when yeah. you enter the operation theater. Is it in? Are you in in, in trance or you're you're you're, you're in no. flow or or, or you, what, what's the what's the you're just sensing? Oh, so, very often you've been talking with a patient on forehand yourself, otherwise a colleague could have done it, but usually you would always do it yourself. And and then you are just awake. You are uh, you are on, if I may say that, <laughs> not off, but on. Um, 
but you keep your common sense, you're not, your pulse is not that increased or anything like that. You're just focused upon what you're going to do. And the, the, what you learn as a surgeon is to be very goal-oriented. Mm. And you are that in your whole life. You become that in your whole life. And you have always a plan B, plan C, and plan D, or something like that. It means that if you open, uh, with, cut with your knife, or your laparoscopic uh, equipment, then you see something that you haven't expected. Because it's not always as we expect. Uh, patients are not always uh, inside as we expect them to be. Then you have to use your plan B or your plan C. When I was a young surgeon, I participated in a, in a, a kidney transplant. And that was really exciting for me because there had been a, uh, this patient had had a kidney transplant before. And then I saw that the kidney was placed much more forward in the, in the abdomen than where the kidneys are usually placed. That is because it's more convenient to put it there. And then if you had to take it out, as we had to do in this case, then it's also easier. So when you make a, a kidney transplant, you have to think about, oh, we hopefully never, but it could be that we have to take it out. So it has to be placed in an area where I can take it out. And also that we have to take care of the of all the organs, of course, the vessels, etc., uh, in the patient. So you can add a new kidney. Mm. when that times come and maybe take that out as well etc so this about having a plan a b and c is really something that you have to focus upon and can you apply that to life as well i it's part of my it has become part of my spine or <laughs> genome or whatever so it means that if i for i'm traveling a a lot around the world with the WHO, the World Health Organization, where we have this collaborating center activities. And it means that, okay, I know I will go there, but if the plane is uh, delayed or something like that, then I know I have time to do this and that. And in the end, we could give in the, in the transit hall, we could make a, a, a YouTube or some kind of a, a video uh, and send all what we would have said at the meeting. We could do and, and yeah. uh, we could record that and then send it. So yeah, I think it's all over. And now, because you you, you did this transition, you did your PhD related to alcohol and surgery and surgery, and then you continued that research and and kind of. A, merged into research full time. That's right. And and I also what we did which I find really funny because now I'm I'm also working in the psychiatric department on addiction medicine and um with research and development and many of these methods that we use for surgical patients are absolutely useful for psychiatric patients as well. So for me, it's really interesting to go from surgery and then say, what is good in surgery? What can be used in other places? And hopefully also vice versa. But we have a lot of knowledge across the specialities that we really don't use because we're so focused on, oh, I'm a surgeon. I have this surgical approach and the plan A, B, and C always, etc. cetera. Um, and and uh, the cardiologist has another tradition, way of working, uh, etc. But it's so good to be so interesting to be uh, working like I do to get today, where I look more across the specialities, more across the hospitals, not only in Sweden and Denmark, but also in, in worldwide, to see what works here, what works there, what can we use. And we are much more similar, mm -hmm. uh, maybe because we read the same. We have the same medical books, mm. <laughs> and the patients are very similar across the countries. So you, you, you did this transition from, from one patient to the whole patient group? Yeah. Instead of saving one, you could save a thousand. Yeah, and I think that is 
what really makes sense um, because of course when you're a trained surgeon and you don't do surgery anymore you really don't know where to put your hands mm. in the beginning <laughs> but but it makes so much sense and that as a surgeon I could maybe I could save some few lives uh, during a night shift um, but the way I'm working today I hope that I can save thousands of lives. T tell us about your milestones. One exciting thing is before it, it took seven years from intervention to be proven and now it takes that's, one year. Yeah, hopefully. that's right. Um, when you look across the, the patient pathway or the patient groups or the hospitals or primary care and secondary care, etc., then you realize that there's something general for all areas which could be improved. One of them is the implementation. And implementation is really a challenge in the healthcare system. It might be a challenge in all other places as well, but we need to implement the new strong evidence, for instance, of new treatment, of new diagnostics, etc., new recovery uh, programs. And in, in error, it takes about seven years from you have the evidence in the hand until it is implemented to the patients. Mm -hmm. Of course, a few patients, very enthusiastic and powerful, might be able to get the evidence a little before the others, but, but for the whole patient group, it takes about say, seven years to have it implemented. Mm. And here my temper is still very surgical. I cannot wait seven <laughs> <Yeah>. years. <laughs> I don't want to wait seven years. So we have described, put together some good ideas, some validated tools, etc., put together in an operational model, and then we have uh, tested it in a randomized trial, which gives you the highest evidence, strongest, it could give you the strongest evidence possible from one study. And then we have tested that you can actually implement all these uh, elements about quit smoking and uh, all this kind of stuff we talked about, you can implement that within 12 months. Mm. And this model has been tested only among what you could call health promotion activities for patients and staff, but you could probably use it in other areas. You need to test that. But it seems to be a very simple model uh, and it could t it would take you one year to to have it implemented. It's really amazing. And now you're working with the World Health Organization, and the European headquarters are in Copenhagen, That's close right. to you. And uh, here in in Lund, Malmo, you have your own crew, so to say, because they're individual offices, and this office is specialized. In implementation of evidence-based health promotion, that's yeah. right. And then your studies really get a huge effect because you change the way the World Health Organization, the recommendations, yeah. your research. Yeah, what we, this research, uh, the model, and also this about that the, only the intensive studies, the intensive programs works for patients uh, it has been described before, but the consequences has not been taken in the same way. So now when we are updating uh, in, in a strong, strong, close collaboration with WHO, uh, we are updating the standards for implementing health promotion in hospitals and other healthcare settings, then we have changed the recommendation from being just short intervention, briefer intervention, to include and put focus upon the, uh, the intensive intervention programs for patients. Mm. That, that's a huge step forward. Mm. And, and when you look ahead, you have a lot of projects going on right now. There's both in Copenhagen, where you're studying new ways to, to uh, improve the health, and here in uh, Lund Malmö, where, where, where you try to improve it in real life. And you have uh, approximately 10 projects, 10 doctorants going on now, but it's five going out the door, so it's 
We have to add some more. Yeah. Exactly. Well, you have a <laughs> you have a lot of things on your plate, so to say. Absolutely. And you're working long hours. How many hours a week you think? I don't count them. You can't count them all. No, I, I don't count them. It doesn't make sense because I think it's so funny to do this uh, kind of work. So if you should be honest, you should count it both as your work and as your yeah. hobby. and as your That's great because then you got a longer <laughs> life. Exactly. Longer <laughs> week, twice the amount. Yeah. Um, but what, what do you see in your, in your temporary projects? What, what's the brightest stars that could change people's lives in the projects that we're doing now or yeah, in the future yeah in the in the 10 projects that you have now um i really hope that we can improve support the psychiatric patients mental ill patients to get a better health because the mental and the physical health is so closely connected so And, and mental health patients are very often have over, like, neglected or overlooked the the the, the needs for for uh, a better health and to avoid somatic complication in addition to the mental problems. So this is really where we are putting a lot of effort in the future to make sure that the psychiatric patients are getting really good programs. They should not only be for surgical patients, they should be for mental ill patients as well. And by doing that, we might, in an even better way, add to the equity in health, because that is very much based upon the patient's needs. And, and the mental health patient has very often higher needs, compare more needs compared to other patient groups. So we definitely need to take care of those. In the Scandinavian countries, they pass away about 15 years before the background population. That is not only because they're having some specific uh, medication or they have uh, their psychiatric illness, etc. The majority of their of their lost lives uh, is related to unhealthy lifestyle and chronic medical diseases or non-communicable diseases, as it's also called. There's a huge potential for improvement. Yeah, and and young researchers today who want to explore, uh, what, what advice could you give them if they want to gain the Nobel Prize in 25 years? Oh, I'm not sure this will ever give a Nobel Prize here. If you want a Nobel Prize, you should look more, much more into genomes and molecules and uh, things like that. Very, very important as well. Absolutely. But the clinical research is really fantastic because you work together with the patients, you talk with the patients, and if you are really brainy, then you invite the patient to participate in your project group, coming up with their ideas, the way they see, the needs they see, and then together with the patient, uh, you can develop much better programs, much better hypotheses to be tested. Mm. We, have, uh, we have patients involved in our projects and we have patients involved in our, in our research advisory board as well. It's so necessary to have their voice mm. talking about what they see as a problem. Of course, also the medical doctors, the nurses, uh, the um, leadership management, everybody else, even the politicians uh, are important, of course. But The patients, the reason we are here are because of the patients. So they should be in center. And they're not in center if they are, are waiting outside the door. And if you want to contribute over a long span of time, you have to be old. So what, what would be your best advice to become 100 years old? <laughs> Choose some good parents. Yeah. <laughs> And after you have done that, I mean... A major part of it is related to your DNA and your genomes. Um, a, another part is to avoid uh, harming yourself. Um, a good doctor said, if you cannot treat the patient well, at least do not do no harm. <laughs> That's important, and we should 
say that to ourselves, that we should not harm ourselves. And that is what you do when you really have an unhealthy lifestyle. Be kind to yourself. And, you, and we, we, we talked about you know, drinking and smoking and, and exercising, but you think that the, the, the two next big things that aren't so explored today will be sleep and stress. Yeah, that's a very important. It could be part of the uh, of the traditional lifestyle intervention that you get a better sleep if you don't drink and a better sleep if you don't smoke and you will avoid this uh, ups and downs related to uh, withdrawal symptoms from smoking or not smoking, etc. For a period, um, and and if you want to, after you have done that, then you then you really need to focus upon what else can help me uh, sleep better and, and not be stressed, not be that influence on the, on the work or the family or the challenges, etc. Because you don't really work well when you don't sleep and you are, if you become stressed. So it's really important that you feel well, you take care of your family and you do all the good things to make your solary batteries uh, working perfect. <laughs> that sounds great. Warm thank you and the best of luck with your important research for humanity. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot.